my name is Pinky Gilani and you are watching Pinky TV. Thank you so much for watching on Facebook. Drop a comment and let us know where you are watching from. And if you are on YouTube, don't forget to subscribe. Welcome to What Women Want Online. This is the show where you get to meet incredible people who share stories of hope, resilience, and excellence. Today is a very special episode of What Women Want uh, Online, and I am super excited and honored. These conversations are brought to you by SBM Bank and by Safaricom. If you'd like to learn about how you can find your voice, then this is the show for you. Honorable Martha Karua has been a member of parliament since 1992, a former magistrate and has been recognized by the Human Rights Watch. She's advanced the cause for women and has been an activist for widening of democratic space and gender issues in Kenya. She's the person with so many firsts. When you Google the most powerful woman in Kenya, her name comes up first. She has been called very principal. She is the party leader of NARC Kenya and I'm so honored to have her here today. The womanhood, the power, the grace, and the lady who epitomizes strength, a past presidential candidate and a future candidate too. Welcome, Honorable Martha Karua. Thank you, Pinky. It's a pleasure. It's so nice to see you again. It's so nice to have you on this show. Um, as you can see, I'm just thrilled for, uh, for being you. here today. Thank you for having me. <laughs> All right, mm -hmm. so I want to speak about, you know, your paternal grandmother. Mm -hmm. She's been spoken about before. Yeah. Obviously has had a huge impact in your life. Uh, she's, been, she's always lived on her own rules. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me uh, maybe a memory in your childhood where you, where you saw her and you thought, this is a woman of strength and maybe this is the woman that I would like to be one day? There's this one day we are sitting outside our compound because her house was always next to ours and uh, over the ridge we saw my aunt her firstborn daughter who is now late being physically abused by her husband wow. on a walkway they were walking I don't know where they, they were coming from and whatever the issue was but we would see my aunt getting hit and falling down and my grandmother went into the house, came out with a panga and with uh, a stick that uh, she used to use to mash food, a mashing mm -hmm. stick. And she went muttering that she will not let this God forsaken man kill her daughter. I went running after her in tow. We crossed the river, went to the other ridge. And as she came upon them, without hesitation, she wielded her stick and hit the son-in-law so hard when he checked and saw that it was the mother-in-law you know it's taboo yeah he just walked away i don't know whether my auntie ever paid for that uh, <laughs> for that uh, um, smack uh, on her husband by my grandmother but that ended that particular episode Wow. We went back home after a while, my auntie went home. It's unfortunate that she passed on uh, earlier this year. Oh. It's not this year, last year. Uh -huh. And I hadn't ever asked her whether she ever paid when wow. she went home. But uh, you can imagine it was taboo. She did it. And wife beating was accepted. But here is my aunt being brutalized before her very own eyes. And she refuses to accept it and she goes and fights for her. Wow. I mean, it's a memory that has remained. How old in were me. you? I couldn't have been more than 10. That's yeah. That's amazing. And I do remember many other the stories she told me of her life before. I was full of admi admiration for her. And the way I saw her, the way she interacted with people, the way she stood her ground, I grew up under her influence. Clearly. And if you ask me my ro first role model, it will be my mother and my grandmother, my paternal grandmother, and then my father. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So now you've brought up your, your mother and your father. Yeah. Um, I'm correct in saying that you are the second born. Yes, I am. Uh, but clearly, you know, I think your parents have uh, spent a lot of time in empowering and educating. You know, f initially, I think there was this thought that it's always the first born, it's always the first born, but you were... Us, many children. We and have eight. Eight children. Yeah. 
So for girls, for boys. And I believe they, they educated and empowered each one of you equally. Each one of us. My sister, who is the firstborn, we are one year apart. Mm. So we started school together. We've grown up together. More like twins than uh, firstborn and secondborn. Wow. Yeah. And is it important for parents to do this, to empower and educate their it children? It is important for parents to empower, especially to make each child believe in themselves. I don't think that there's a template for raising children, but how you raise them matters. And uh, I grew up believing in myself. And I remember one time I told my dad that I would like to be a judge. You know, a magistrate in the rural areas was known and is still known as a judge. Right. It's now that the high courts are everywhere that people are learning to differentiate between a magistrate and a judge. Mm -hmm. So we had once gone before a judge with my father. He had a traffic case. And I think I loved the way the judge was the center of attention and speaking with authorities. So as we were leaving, I told him I want to be a judge. And he told me he had no objection. I just had to work very hard. That stuck with me. And I worked hard. Later on, I learned that to be a judge, you got to study law. So I focused my eyes on studying law. I was, as I was doing my O-levels, I was working hard to get grades, to go for A-levels, having my eyesight on the university to do law. And it came to be, because it is said, what you profess with your mouth, it will come to be, if you work for it. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow, it's so <laughs> fascinating to hear these stories. You know, sometimes yeah. we think that success just ends up on your lap, but you do have to work for it. No, you have to work for it throughout. And I can tell you that since my days in secondary school, I was focusing on doing well to go to A-levels. Those days there was A-levels and eventually to university. Wow. Yeah. Um, just talking about your upbringing again, yeah. something that happened recently where you were quoted and I'm wearing the shirt, I was not taught. Yes. I think that was very powerful yeah. um, in the sense that um, I, I can say the same. I was never taught. Yeah. My there mother is, never taught me. <laughs> there is no academy mm -hmm. where women are taught to be different from men. Mm -hmm. These are things we are socialized. We learn from the society around us. Some of us don't learn those things. Some of us resist them. My grandmother belonged to a different age group, a different time, a different time when yes. there was no solidarity among women, when there was no women's movement, but she was who she was and she could not accept injustice before her very own eyes. Right. She fought for her space. Yes. So there are many people in society who are like that. So I was not taught. My being does not accept willingly, allowing myself to be discriminated, allowing myself to be treated as a secondary human being. And I suppose that's why a question like that could elicit that kind of reaction yes. from me, because my whole being did not like it. No. I did not accept it. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I resonated with that so much. And I think many women did. Many women and men as well. And men as well. Yes. And it's not something I planned. It's just a reaction from a question. Right. Yeah. So, of course, you are known as the Iron Lady. Um, this is a term that has been given to you, the name that has been given to you. Does this make you, make you show up differently? Not at all. I just say, whatever label you give me, it doesn't define me. Oh, so I, I continue that. to be who I am. And because I cannot stop people from giving labels, I just move on. I don't take notice. Yeah. How do you become, how do you become like this, especially because you are so much in the public? You know, everybody has an opinion. Yeah. Everybody has something to say. How do you become so thick-skinned? I think just one has to be because if you stopped to argue with everybody 
who gives you a label or who expresses an opinion about yourself, you'd never get to where you're going. So I keep on saying that I will not let distractors stop me. I keep walking, nevertheless, mm. yes. Eyes on the prize. Eyes on the prize, never getting distracted. So yeah. you've also said that, um, mm. uh, you said that I don't have a need to be liked. Uh, no, I don't have that craving because if you try too hard, then it, it interferes with what you want to do and it, it interferes with who you are. So long as I'm confident that what I'm doing is right and I'm not being unfair to anyone, then I've got to keep doing it. Mm. Yeah. But where do you think this, this, um, this, this um, feeling, this where we're searching as women to mm -hmm. be validated by society, the need to be liked, comes from? I think uh, from uh, the patriarchal setting we are in, because you grow up knowing that women are validated or referenced with men. It will be daughter of so and so, and it will not be your mom, it will be mm. your father. Mm. It will be every, the center of uh, power within the home. You grow up knowing it's your father. Mm. You may even notice that sometimes your mother is not being treated fairly. And it's not just about your mother, it will be about the next woman in the village. And when you grow seeing all these things, then you have to unlearn. If they are not agreeing with your system, you have to unlearn. I remember at an early age asking a relative, Who's, who was being given a tongue lashing by the husband. When the husband moved away, I asked her, why don't you answer him? Wow. He just told me, she just told me, child, you'll know when you grow up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a tongue lashing in the presence of children, in the presence of workers, this happens to women every day, mm -hmm. you know? That's how come my late auntie was being brutalized by the husband on a path where everybody is pa passing in public because he felt he had that authority and it was accepted by society that men could discipline their wives. My grandmother, as part of that society, did not accept it. Her being rejected it. And I'm forever grateful to her. May she rest in peace yeah. for the life lessons that she gave me. Yeah. And indeed, you are carrying them <laughs> forward. Oh, my gosh. And I see it in my granddaughter. And yeah. I haven't told her many stories because she's only eight. Oh, wow. But I can see she stands her ground. That's, that yeah. must make you very proud. I'm happy, but I'm saying she'll be Kali. <laughs> <laughs> Good for her. Because they come better than us. Yes, Yeah. they do. Yeah. They do. Yeah. In fact, I, I did want to talk mm -hmm. to you about your mm -hmm. children, uh, mm -hmm. your two sons. And no, a daughter and a son. Sorry, yeah. a, a daughter and yeah. a son. It's, be, it's been in the media, it's not your fault. Yeah, I've seen Everybody two says sons, two, two boys, sons. Two boys, yeah. No, it's a daughter and a son. Okay, Yeah. so did you bring them up differently or the no, same? No, just the same. And what did you teach? Because I know as mothers, I, I have the same, I have a daughter and a son. Yeah. Um, as mothers, yes, we will impart our wisdom to our daughters, but I feel also we have to be a, very aware yeah. of what we are teaching our sons so they do not brutalize their wives on the streets. They do not disrespect yeah. women in public. I think it's trial. Parenting is really trial and error because you never can know whether what you're doing is working. It manifests later. But I know that both my children accompanied me to many women's meeting and my son could mimic when he was just entering his teens, he could repeat what we were saying, mm -hmm. what needs to be done for women. Whether he internalized it, it's a different issue, but it will not be for want of teaching, of letting them know that each individual is valued and is appreciated as they are. Absolutely. Yeah. Whether man, whether woman, but each individual is appreciated and given the space to grow. Yeah. So again, just talking about you as a mother, I yeah. read that one day you had to sit your children down and yeah. have that conversation with them where you may not come back home. Oh, yeah, 
the days um, the uh, Moi regime was hounding critics and we had been taken to court for contempt of court charges as council members of the law society. And it looked like the regime was hell-bent on getting us jailed on trumped-up charges because the total complaint that we were discussing politics. Never mind that the then constitution had political rights as part of it, freedom of expression, right. freedom of association. So why would anybody take us to court on contempt of court charges for speaking politics? Apart from being a law society council member, we were also Kenyans. So while battling these charges and seeing how things were presenting, I had to sit my children who were quite young and tell them one was uh, four, the other one was six, and tell them, look, there is a urge because children don't understand cases. Yes. Yes. I was just telling them there was this urge that might take us away wow. and might put me in prison. They don't know where, what prison is, but put me in a place where I'll not be able to come back, you know? Of course they wouldn't understand, but you have to mention just in case it happens. So yeah. what goes through your mind as yeah. a mother yeah. to be able to have this conversation with her very young children? No, it's just that it looked like jail was imminent. Okay. So it was a necessary thing to do. I was going to leave them in the care of my sister mm -hmm. who had her own one child. So we were two mothers and three children. And I needed to take them through that, you know. I knew they would be in good hands, but they needed an explanation why I'm away. I'm not on a trip. Yes. They need to know. They need to have a rough idea. Yeah, it's painful, but it's necessary. Yeah. Is it important for us to be mm -hmm. honest with our children? I think to us, a large extent, yes, to avoid them being completely traumatized in a way that it's difficult for you to help them recover later, yeah. Mm. Oh, that's amazing. Mm. Um, I, I now wanna talk ab about your career and mm. a question that, that was um, asked to the, the Prime Minister of New Zealand in 2017. Yeah. Um, the question was, a lot of women have to make a choice between having babies and having a career. This question was asked in the 21st century, can you imagine? It's happening and in the first world. Yes, and yes. in the first world. Yes. It created a lot of controversy, but I feel in Kenya, this attitude is still applicable. I mean, yeah. the, you know, people can still ask us these questions. Um, and, you know, we were having this conversation before, women and men get yeah. asked different questions. Yeah. When, when is this going to change? What, what does it take to make this narrative shift? I think really we have to re-engineer society and that is what our 2010 constitution is trying to do by directing us on the path to equality. And that's why the affirmative action is the first start, it's a starting line, but the destination is equality between the genders. And I think that for a serious administration we need policies and campaigns which are multifaceted to change the way, to cause a shift in the way we think. In the examples our children are given in school, you see some school books are still placing men in authority, women in subservient positions. Around our boardrooms, the constitution is trying to say let there be not less than one third of any gen gender or two thirds of any gender yeah. in appointive and elective public positions. It's one way of re-engineering society, but we need to go beyond that. We need a campaign and awareness that helps us to bridge that gap. And as women, we need this conversation because we nurture more than the men do. Our impressions and what we teach our children can help accelerate the pace at which we re-engineer society by ensuring that gender relations education starts right at the cradle. Absolutely. And in school, the same. 
so that we teach our children to respect every individual, not through gender eyes, yeah. but every human being, and not through use of force, not how strong as a person you are, but every human being deserves to be respected and valued. In our homes, we have to practice it. Stop brutalizing uh, women within the domestic setting because people watch what you do more than what you say. Mm -hmm. Our boys are learning at home how not to treat women. So we need to think about that and to really have a campaign. And I believe it will work because even when you look at the countries that have made strides, Rwanda, which is next door, Sweden, the Nordic countries, and the many countries in the first world, the same narratives are there. I was in uh, Denmark in 2016 when they were having their election and there was a female prime minister and she was campaigning to get re-elected. She, she wasn't re-elected, but these gender-based um, slurs were still coming up. Someone was questioning a portal she took as prime minister with the former president of the United States, President Obama, in South Africa during President Mandela's funeral, you know? <laughs> and I'm sure so many men took photos with Obama, so many other mm. presidents, but this photo by the president, a female prime minister was being questioned. And, you know, there were some suggestions. So you find that although there are many other good things happening in such countries, gender-based discrimination and certain narratives with sexual innuendos will still be applicable to women. And I watched the bully that is President Trump of America circling around Hillary Clinton in a presidential debate, if you remember that. Yes. How do you walk around a fellow mm candidate, menacingly, not even politely. Yes, yeah. Would he do that if it was a male candidate? Did the people feel revulsion of such conduct? He ended up getting elected. Mm. Never mind that Hillary got the popular vote, but he too got a sizable vote. Why, if we do not approve of such behavior? Yes. So you can see that society largely accepts misbehavior and bullying of women by men. Wow. We've got to re-engineer and unlearn these bad habits. I've made it a long life commitment to unlearn every bad habit I've learned. I love this yeah. word. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mm -hmm. come back to, to this word. I mm -hmm. think it's such a powerful word. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I still want to just remain a little bit on, on your career and um, yeah. your opinion. Do you believe that the people get the government that they deserve? In a way, yes. Because it is the people's responsibility to elect. If they elect without information, they'll still deserve that government. Or if they do not process the information well. And I believe that uh, we may think the electorate don't know what they're doing. They do. If you look at the various elections, let's talk of our country. Mm -hmm. At independence, they overwhelmingly voted for the government they wanted. That was a Kanu government. There was yeah. Kanu and Kadu. They overwhelmingly voted for Kanu. If you look at the subsequent elections, even though there was interference in elections, they would vote for people who articulated their issues. That's why the late Martin Shikuku was always voted in. That's why characters like J.M. Karaoke were voted in. There was gerrymandering here and there, but constantly people elect who they want. If you look when multi party was reintroduced in 1992, we were voted in. Mount Kenya area was uh, an opposition zone, so people knew what they were doing. Bungoma was another opposition zone. Mm -hmm. Luanyanza and Kisi were opposition zones. So you can see people were conscious. And then come 1992, although countrywide, Kanu kept on getting 
votes to return them to power. In 1992, when people saw a window of opportunity when the National Rainbow Coalition was born, people realized that finally, we just have a chance of removing Kanu from power. The country united and with one voice ejected Kanu out. 67% is what yeah. President Kebaki got and ushered in a new regime. So people generally know what they are doing. And that's why we have to keep imploring our fellow countrymen and women to vote on the basis of values, of issues, and not on the basis of the handouts. Because our elections have become handout elections ever since 2007. Our elections have become handout elections. Mm -hmm. I would urge Kenyans to remember we have the power to change the course of our history and our destiny by voting value-based leadership. And this, we can remind ourselves we've done it before. We did it to usher in independence. We did it to usher in multi-party, even though we did not change the leadership. And we eventually in 2002 did it to give Kanu, you know, to, to send Kanu packing. Yeah. We now can say goodbye to leadership that is not value-based, that is not issue-based. We need leaders of integrity to pull this country from the quagmire it is in. We need leaders of integrity from the MCA in your ward to the presidency. And this is what we must do for ourselves. I'm, I'm glad you brought up that word mm -hmm. leadership. You know, they say in a crisis, yeah. a, a leader emerges. Yeah. And I've been, I've been looking. Yeah. I've really been looking because yeah. we are, in, the whole world is in a crisis with yeah. this pandemic. Yeah. Who according to you is a good leader? A good leader is somebody who puts the needs of the people first who is committed to serving the people, who keep their promises to the people. And where those promises become impossible to implement, a person who will discuss with the people why this is happening and what else they can do. A leader must have a listening ear. It's not about what they want. It's a leader who engages the people, not and lashes out at them. You don't think we're too far down to be able to? No, I think we can do it. We've done it before. Yes. That's what I'm saying. This looks difficult, but imagine we've done it several other times before. We just need to remind ourselves we can do it. And the way to change Kenya, we will change it from the counties, a word at a time. So stop wondering how we can organize Kenya. Organize your word. Mm -hmm. And if everybody in, within the wards organize themselves, you will have organized your constituency as well. And if that happens in all the wards in the county, you will have organized the county. You will have organized Kenya because each county is part of the jigsaw puzzle called Kenya. Yes. So can we all focus in the areas we think we can tackle? That's the message. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Are we going to see a female president? Very soon. The future yeah, is yeah. female. Absolutely, yes. I agree. I do agree. Yeah. So let, let's go back to this powerful word, word yeah. that you've been using throughout this um, conversation is yeah. unlearn. Yeah. I strongly believe that it is our responsibility to unlearn mm -hmm. and heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. how, how and when did you understand that you needed to unlearn? I think one, we have all to, to all admit that we are products of patriarchy, both women and men. So when we use the word patriarchy, we don't mean men, mm -hmm. because we all have to unlearn patriarchy. And when we talk of feminism, it doesn't just mean women. It's everybody who is committed to gender equality. And that's why President Obama and the Pope are recognized as yeah. feminists. Yes. So let me say that I was not always aware, self-aware, and I grew up with the prejudices that you pick in a patriarchal setting. I had heard as I grew up that 
when women meet, all they do is gossip. Nobody ever accused men of gossiping when they meet. And they, they are do. meeting to discuss <laughs> world affairs, but women meet to gossip. Right. So I remember when I was um, working as a magistrate in Nakuru, I had just been posted there. And I received a written invitation by the Business and Professional Women's Club of Nakuru to join them as a young professional who has hit town. I was so contemptuous of that invite, I never even responded yeah. to it, you know. Fast forward, that was around 82. I come to Nairobi and I ceased to be a magistrate in 87 and I become an activist for human rights and, and democracy. I'm still not aware of myself as a woman and I start seeing discrimination. We are going for the treason, Koigi treason case. I was representing federal lawyer Miruge Karioki and I hear the police telling each other that Martha Njoka, I was going by the name Martha Njoka mm -hmm. then, is coming, Kichwa Ngumu, <laughs> but don't let her pass. You know, I just held my clipboard. When I got to where they were, I just hit them with the clipboard and pushed. Wow. You know, the shock of them, just that hitting them, mm -hmm. set them apart and I passed. And I told them, shoot. And I walked, wow. continued walking towards the court. You see, now you start noticing that discrimination. I've been described as Kichwangumu. My other colleagues, the male colleagues in the case, I've not had anybody call them Kichwangumu, mm -hmm. but Kichwangumu applies to me because I'm a woman. So I start noticing those differentials. Mm -hmm. Then I join International Federation of Women Lawyers, Kenya chapter, and in 1990, I go to Uganda with a federal lawyer, Beatrice Duta, as delegates of FIDA. We paid for ourselves. Those days there were no uh, partners to partner with mm -hmm. FIDA. We paid for ourselves and that's why we were sent because we afforded to pay for our own tickets. And we go to Uganda and I find the women are not just organized. The government is recognizing women. It was a FIDA conference. Yeah. The government unleashed its pro uh, protocol officers to meet the FIDA delegates at the airport. So we were given royal treatment. We go to the conference, we hear the things being spoken, and I then learn of the quota system, which the NRM government had already uh, started using in Uganda. District seats, what, what, that kind of thing. I came back a transformed person, realizing that we can do something about discrimination against women. We can change the environment we live in, and we can hold each other's hands as we go through this. So we came, reorganized FIDA, and the rest is history. Wow. Yeah. So change, it begins with us first. Change begins with the individual. And I keep saying, because I know that I found my baptism of fire in Uganda, just like Paul found his on the way to Damascus. Mm -hmm. Uganda is my Damascus. Wow. That was my Damascus moment. Every individual must have their Damascus moment. And as women, we need to be self-aware. You may be a top executive, therefore discrimination on a daily basis is not so obvious mm -hmm. to you. Maybe when you go to a boardroom full of men, you will then realize that something is odd, but because you are with the privileged, you might even laugh at jokes made out of, you know, mm -hmm. of women, because most jokes in a patriarchal society are laughing at women. Insults, are insulting women, whether you are mother or yourself, mm. you know? So we have to unlearn those habits that appear no more and to resist them whenever they appear. I came changed from Uganda and since then, my antennas are out. I pick the slightest discrimination and I deal with it. And even within parliament, I remember many times I told males, your mothers are tired. So stop swearing by us unnecessarily. You know, like telling each other your mother, mm -hmm. you know? I tell them, use your father or yourself. Yeah, we are very tired having carried you. 
<laughs> we have no strength left. So we used to just make a joke out of it. It's, am it's yeah. amazing yeah. That, um, mm -hmm. um, that you're so outspoken mm -hmm. and now that's, that's exactly who you are. And, yeah. And you own it completely. I own it. I found myself. And I love myself just as I, I am. I love that as yeah. well. This is yeah. what we preach here yeah. on this show. You have yeah. to find yourself, own it, love yourself, mm -hmm. and be completely unapologetic. And be at ease with who you are. Yes. Yeah, life is not a rehearsal. You live once. Mm -hmm. So let's make the best out of it and make our contribution to change society for the better. And that's a journey I have vowed to walk till the day I breathe no more. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> Do you see why I was so nervous to sit in this presence? Mm. Um, mm. I, I'm so grateful. You're welcome. Always so grateful. It's you're welcome. Just, I do. You're so gracious. Mm. And, um, and thank you for being so honest. And mm. thank you for giving us so, so much wisdom. I think I'm going to ask one more question mm -hmm. um, before I let you go. I, I, I mean, mm. okay, if you'd allow me, I would sit yeah. here the whole day and pick your brain. <laughs> um, when you were a little girl, mm -hmm. you had dreams. Yeah. Um, and I wonder what young girls today, if they're dreaming the same dreams, and what you would like to tell them in regards to those dreams and how to live their lives. I would just like to use Lupita Nyong'o's words, that all dreams are valid. Pursue your dream relentlessly, but just know it will not come on a platter. It's hard work, it's persistence, it's consistence, it's hard work. And have a purpose in life. And I think our purpose is to leave this world a better place than we found it. And I feel that in a way we've let down our grandchildren because we seem to be going backwards yeah. instead of forward in matters human rights, matters democracy, matters rule of law. That is why I cannot say that it is time for me to call it quits. We really must do this together, reorganize our society, leave a better environment for our children, our grandchildren. And that's my calling and your calling too. Yeah. I completely agree. Yeah. Um, Honorable Martha Karua and I mm -hmm. would love to hear from you, so make sure you leave a comment and let us know what you think of today's episode. What are your key takeaways? Thank you very much. Karibu sana. And Karibu sana. Our future president. <laughs> I look forward to seeing. Um, Sooner than you think. Yay, you. yay, yay. <laughs> um, and mm. of course, I will wear this when I vote for you. I'll yeah. wear this t shirt when I go vote. And do let them know we were not taught. <laughs> yeah, we yeah. were not. There are taught. things we just can't be taught and which we must unlearn yes. if they accidentally slip through. Absolutely. Yeah. And yeah. take responsibility. This is what I mm -hmm. like. Mm -hmm. What I've learned from you today is mm -hmm. taking responsibility mm -hmm. and going forward from, Thank from you. that. Thank you. Um, for your chance to win with Safaricom, make sure you subscribe to the newsletter on uh, of What Women Want. And remember, these conversations are brought to you by SBM Bank. SBM is always thinking of you, their client, through works workplace banking. SBM has made unsecured accessible loans available for its clients. On this show, we have conversations that aim to inspire and we hope that these conversations cause you to take a deep dive within yourself. Find out who you are. Real power is always internal. Real power is self-love. Real power is from your core and real power comes from authenticity. There's nothing like showing up as your true self. Find that person and show up as that person every day. The world will be grateful that you did. Thank you for watching and we'll see you again real soon. Bye-bye.